We've reached um, quite a significant moment in our journey through Exodus. The Israelites um, are gathered at Sinai. They've made it to that place, that place where God first called Moses. He called him from the burning bush and he commissioned him then and there to go out and to lead God's people out of Egypt. And now, now it's not just Moses here, but the whole Israelite people are gathered in that same place. They've arrived, they're here at the mountain. The mountain that God said to them would be a sign of his promise and his faithfulness. Back in chapter 3, verse 12, we read God say those very words, that you will come here and it will be a sign to you of my faithfulness when you make it to this place. So now they're here, a free people. God has redeemed them from slavery. He's um, judged the Egyptians. He's um, destroyed their armies. He's led the, the, uh, the Israelite people safely and um, protected them from the angel of death. Led them through the, um, the wilderness in quite miraculous and quite unusual ways. And now here. So, is it the end of the story? Well, we can probably guess from the length of the rest of Exodus that no, it's not <laughs> the end of the story. Because the story up until now has one, been one of God revealing to the people who he is. God has taken the initiative. He's shown them who he is. He's made himself known. And we, along with the Israelites, have seen through these first 18 chapters just what an awesome, mighty, powerful, faithful God he is. But now we get to the crux of the matter. <clears throat> now we begin to understand not just who God is, but why he has called his people together. We understand what he has saved them for. And it's all summed up in one word, relationship. All of the first 18 chapters have been moving the people forward to this point, where they meet with the Lord and where they discover that he has purposes and plans for them. And our passage this morning is a little bit of a summary of what's happened, where they're at and where they're going to be, what's going to happen next. So, if you've got your Bibles with you, hopefully it will come up on the screen. Um, we're going to read. Um, our passage is actually chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, but just to put it in a little bit more context, I want to read um, from the, the chapter beginning, from verse 1. So, Exodus chapter 19, verses 1, starts like this. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are said to say to the descendants of Jacob. And what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Let's just pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word, for your story, for the way that you interact with us, your people. And Lord, we pray that as we read your word together and study it this morning, you would speak a word. <coughs> we might be equipped to be people and the church that you have called us to be. Amen. So God has brought his blacks out of Egypt to this place at this time because he's got something very important for them to do. 
He's called them together as a unique, as a people with a unique past, to be a people with a unique privilege, but because God has a unique purpose and plan for them. And what we have in these verses is a short summary of these things, the things that come form the basis and the detail of the covenant, the agreement that God makes with his people. And he sets it in place, I think, in these verses in three key ways. Firstly, by drawing their attention to their unique past, to what he has already done for them. And secondly, by establishing what he is asking of them in return. And then thirdly, by revealing what it is that he is going to do through them. And so we're going to look at each of those three things this morning. What he has done for them, what he asks from them, and what he promises to do through them. And what he has done for them is salvation. The first thing that God instructs Moses to say to the people on his behalf. We read in verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did and you did. They as people have been eyewitnesses to the most amazing evidence of God's power. First through the plagues and then through everything that happened as God led them out of the region. And it's vital for all that comes from now on that they see and they understand and they never forget just who it was that acted on their behalf. There is no other reason for them being here at this time and in this moment other than the action of God. God and God alone is the one who acted to bring them out of Egypt. They were totally powerless. Their 400 years of slavery proved to them just how powerless they were to help themselves. But God brought them out. God judged and destroyed their enemies and he did it in such a way that they could be in no doubt as to who he was, as to the might and the power and the utter grace of God. The rest of what God says and does from now on only makes sense if they start by understanding just who he is. But the verse goes on, doesn't it? God didn't just bring them out of Egypt, but it says, I carried you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. There's a purpose, there's a plan, there's a direction of travel here. He brought them to himself. And the language that, um, that is used in Exodus is really intentional, I think. It paints this picture of a, a stunning um, eagle. And it says that God is like an eagle, that he be word is measure. And the eagle would have been a well-known symbol because it's one of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. And the eagle is a magnificent bird of prey. It's got a long beak, it's got huge talons, and it's got a wide, wide wingspan. It's able to soar to high heights. It's hugely protective. It's a bird of prey. It will stop at nothing to protect its young. And these eagles build their nests really far up in the mountain in rocky crevices, far away from the things that might damage them and hurt them, but inaccessible. So those eaglets in their nest are totally dependent on the parent birds for their food, for their sustenance, for their security. And unlike most of the birds, eaglets mature quite slowly. And it takes them about three years, I think, some of them. But when they're ready to fly, the mother bird teaches them to fly in quite an unusual way. It takes them to the edge of the nest and it pushes them out. And of course they can't fly. So they plummet like a stone towards the ground. But thankfully, before disaster hits, the mother bird swoops in and it catches the little and it rescues it and it pops it on the wings and it takes it back up to the nest. And it does this repeatedly, and every time the little bird gets a little bit more used to the feeling of the wind underneath them and begins to learn what it is to fly for themselves. And this is the picture that God paints of him rescuing the Egyptians. He said, I swooped in, I carried you on eagle's wings, and I've taken you out of that place of danger. 
our family and um, really quite enjoy going to the cinema. We went for Charlie's birthday and that's spooky. Um, but years and years ago, Jack and I remember going to, um, to watch the Fellowship of the Rings so that we would get the full benefit of the big screen experience for that dramatic film. And those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans might remember there's a scene in The Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf is trapped on the top of the Tower of Orthanc um, by Sam. And, and a duel, a fight um, ensues. And it looks like um, Gandalf is going to lose. And Saruman towers over him and he demands that uh, Gandalf embrace the darkness and give up. And Gandalf replies, there is only one Lord of the Rings and he does not share power. And then he falls off the edge of this huge tower and plummeting towards the ground and it looks like all hope is lost. And then a giant golden eagle swoops in, catches him on his back and carries him up to safety. And I'm fairly certain that Tolkien wrote that scene with his passage in Exodus in his mind. Because it's the same kind of image, isn't it? A golden eagle being sent as a beacon of hope and rescue. And in the wilderness, the, the Israelites learn what it is to be cared for and protected. They learn that God rescued them. And at times their journey feels perilous, feels dangerous. Many times they cry out to God for rescue. But what we've seen in the last few weeks is that there's a pattern to the way that God works. He does something miraculous, he does something supernatural, and he invites us to participate, to join, to play our part. And that's exactly what the eagle does, and it teaches its willingness to, um, to fly. It supernaturally catches them, but it also gives them the skills they need to learn to fly themselves. What the Israelites learned in the wilderness were the essential skills that they need to become spiritually mature. So God reminds them of who he is and what he's done for them. And then he asks of them in obedience. He sets out how they should respond to the revelation of who he is. He shows them what it looks like to live in relationship with their Redeemer. In response to his rescue, they as a people should, says in verse 5, obey me fully and keep my covenant. The problem is that we often get a little bit caught up here, don't we? We hear God's call for obedience. We hear God's call to um, listen and follow his instructions. And we forget the order that was demonstrated in each verse. And it's important that we know the order. Because first verse says, and look at what I've done, but I have rescued you. And then he says, obey me. Not because of what he's already done, that we ought to obey. Oh, sorry, I'm moving away. All too often we treat God's commands as a list of things that we've got to do in order to be worthy of order to receive his rescue. But that's not the case. God rescued us. He didn't ask the people to obey him to prove their worth. He stepped in and rescued him, and then he asked them to obey him. Obedience isn't necessary to earn rescue, but it is a right response to who God is. There's an order, rescue, obedience, and then there's a promise, a blessing. The trouble is we don't like the sound of the word obedience, do we? We like the idea of God rescuing us and saving us. And we like the idea of being free to be ourselves, but we're not so keen on anyone, not even God, telling us what we should or shouldn't do. But I think what we miss when we think like this is that God's commands are good. He knows what is best for us, and he knows what will help us flourish. So the commands that he asks us to keep aren't designed to restrict or to inhibit us, but they are designed because when we work and live and behave in that kind of way, then we and those around us will flourish. 
but it's not all about us. And I think the bigger thing that we need to grasp is that relationship with God is a privilege, but it is not a relationship of equals. He is almighty God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. All that we are and have is because of him. He is the giver and sustainer of all things. He is above all things, beyond all things, before all things, and will be after all things. He is the Lord. And as it rightly says in our passage, all of the earth is mine. Obedience is simply a sign that we love and respect and recognise who God is. We should be so blown away by the fact that Almighty God invites us to draw close to him, that we want nothing more than to behave and to live in a way that honours the privilege of that invitation. Obedience should be a tangible sign that we get who God is, that we respect his wisdom, that we fully appreciate what he has done. Obedience should be visible proof of our love for God. And later in the Bible, we see this same principle outworked um, as part of a different, a fuller, more complete covenant, one that we are invited into now. As, John, as Jesus himself says in John 14, verse 15, quite simply to his disciples, if you love me, obey my commandments. And later in John's epistles, we read that obeying God's commands show that we love him. And it says also that these commands are not designed to be burdensome. God's instructions are always given because of who he is and they're designed for good. So then he promises that through what he's already done and what he um, has asked of us, there will be blessing. It doesn't finish there. There's more to that order that we mentioned before. It begins with the saving act of God, then comes the response of obedience, and that's followed by a promise of blessing. A blessing that is manifest in the identity it gives to those who rebel, and to the purpose that they get to participate, to share in. Verses 5 and 6 said, If you fully obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There are some wonderful promises wrapped up in that if and then. The first blessing that God attaches to us, to that obedience, is that they will be a treasured possession. He's already shown them that they're special by drawing them out, by rescuing them. But now he says, I want you to obey me that so you keep those channels of relationship open so that you get to love me and I get to love you in the fullness of that. We can treasure one another. When we were growing up, my dad would call me and my sister's treasure so that we would know that we were really special to him. We left a little bit younger than I am now. Um, he still calls me treasure, but now he also calls my children treasure too, because they also are precious. They are also part of that family relationship. And this same term of endearment is what God calls us who love him, who obey him, who are faithful to him. He looks at you and he says, you are my treasure. So God's first purpose in rescuing them is that they would find their identity in him as treasured possession. Here we are in the middle of the desert. God looks down on this bedraggled, dirty, dispossessed load of refugees without a land or a home. And he says to them, you are my treasured possession. He goes on, there's more. Their identity isn't just found in who they are or whose they are, but in what they are supposed to be together. Four short words in the original Hebrew, but ones that have such giant meaning. They are called out of Egypt, out of that place of slavery and downtrodden um, exploitation, to be a kingdom of priests 
a holy nation. Effectively, this is a mission statement for whom the people of God are meant to be. It's a simple, short, but profoundly challenging mission statement. The idea of priests was quite well known. All of the local religions or kingdoms would have had priests, but they would have had priests, one, maybe a group of people who were set aside to be the mediators between God and the people. They were meant to represent God to the people and represent the people to God. They were the ones who were set aside and um, given the task of listening to and discerning what God was saying and doing and instructing the people in following and worshipping God. But after God's revelation to Moses on the mountain, God gives his instructions to Moses. And he extends the role of priests from one person to one whole nation. He says, all of you together are going to be that. And priests have to take on that priestly role. You collectively now have the responsibility not just to, um, to know about me, but to know me. I'm going to give you my law so that you can see what I'm like. You can all have access to it. Together, you take on that priestly function. God's purpose in setting him apart as a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation has always been part of his much bigger picture. It was designed so that they, together, would be a blessing to all nations. They're called to be a kingdom of priests with special access to God, special ministry before God, who reveal and represent God to everyone around them. They're also called to be a holy nation, to be different, to be distinct, to be separate from those around them. God himself is holy, and holiness describes a separateness, a difference, an otherness to all created things. It carries with it a sense of goodness and purity and beauty and wonder. And God calls his people together as a people who will be likewise distinct and separate, set aside. He calls them to live out their lives together in a way that establishes um, a society that is distinctive. They should, by the way that they behave, reveal God, not just amongst themselves, but as a window to the world. He wants his presence and his character and his nature to inform and to transform every aspect of who they are publicly. And the reality is that this should challenge us, shouldn't it? Because is the church today something that stands out as a people who are transformed? As a people who are transforming their society for good? Are we, as God's people, the ones who stand up for justice, who serve our communities, who work for good, who act with sincerity and love and mercy and honesty and grace and accountability? Is that what the church, the people of God, are known for? Or are we more known for our problems? This call to be a kingdom of priests, to recognise the needs of the world, to represent God to people, but also to be a, a holy nation. It's not just for individuals, it's the corporate responsibility of the whole people of God. It's not just any longer for the spiritual elite, it's for all of us. They are to be a nation, defined not by the land that they inhabit, but by the holiness they exhibit. And God's purpose in setting them aside is not just for them, but it's for all people. God promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation and that through him all nations of the world would be blessed. 
And in the wonderful economy of God, he calls out the people to himself and he says, I give you a role in revealing me to the world. And the story continues to be outworked. We are here as a result, as recipients of the grace of Jesus. We've been brought into this family of God. We are part of the special people. So in our passage, we see that God has done, what God has done to them. He's offered them salvation, rescue, that he demands of them obedience, and that he will do through them a great thing. He will bless them with identity, purpose. They will be a kingdom of peace and a holy nation. But what does this mean for us today? Well, the principles laid down in the story should speak loudly to us of our role and calling. God's intention for his people, those who are called by him, remains the same. But our story is much more complete. We know his salvation, not partially from the slavery of Egypt, but totally and fully, perfectly in the person of Jesus. And grasping the enormity of this should change who we are and the lives that we lead. But receiving his salvation, recognising his work, demands a response, demands a change in who we are and how we work. And we know that we are called together, rescued for a purpose. Our identity as God's treasured possessions with precious children, holy and holy love, gives us a unique status and a unique assurance. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says of us, you are the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession. You may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his presence. We are God's chosen people. We are that royal priesthood. And just like the Israelites, we are called to live as a people who reflect his glory. As a kingdom of priests, we have a responsibility to pray for, to intercede on behalf of, and to proclaim God into our world, to those around us. As a holy nation, we are called to be distinctive, to embody kingdom values in who we are, individually and corporately, so that what we do reveals Jesus to the world. Holiness is by its very nature evangelistic. It's always been God's intention that the quality of his people, the distinctive lives that they lead, and the way that they reflect his character, should enable the watching world to see evidently, in tangible ways, the reality of his gospel. It's holiness, it's the otherness of us collectively in our ordinary, individual, everyday lives that should point people to Jesus and should make a difference in the world and society. So as we go into this week, know your calling, know what God has done, know your identity, but know that you have a purpose, that you are called to play your part in being that holy nation, that kingdom of priests, those people who make a difference. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you have made yourself known, that we are able to know you. We thank you for the great privilege that it is to know you as Father, to know that you love and treasure us, that you look upon us and see your beloved children. Thank you that what you require of us is for our good. And Lord, we recognise that there are many areas of our lives where we do not obey you fully, where we have not written your laws upon our hearts, where we have not allowed your Holy Spirit to be at work in us. Father, where there are things that we need to, to lay down, to say sorry for, or to change, we ask for the conviction of your Spirit. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to be that distinctive holy people that care about the world, that live lives that honour you. May we be committed to see your kingdom values rooted into our society. Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come in us. Amen. Amen.